have a good weekend. So today we will take, talk about three things. One is that we talk a little bit, bit about stochastic gradient descent and how to distribute that things. The second thing, we will have a very br brief look at the implementation, how primary server works. Finally, I will show you some demos. Let's start with SGD. So the basic idea of SGD is quite simple. Each, okay, so instead of has the whole training data for the gradient descent, the HGD each time only look at one example. So you can, so this is the algorithm show that for iteration time to one, two, three, four, each time you pick up examples. And use that examples to update the model. So that is, if you choose example i at time t, now you, the first thing you want to do is that you compute the gradient over this exam, example and update the model by the kind of model minus learning rate times the gradient on this example. So this is the basic, basic idea. As you can be see, the cost of each, each iteration is quite small because each time you only touch a row of the training data. And it's often very converge very fast comparing to some batch algorithms. Comparing to the gradient descent, each iteration, the SGD may be make a little progress comparing to if you get the whole data. But given the same time, SGD may run a lot of more iterations than batch SGD. So even that, you make a little progress each time, but you may run 1,000 times more iterations. So you may still win. That is a huge advantage of SGD, despite, okay, there's also some serious aspect about what is SGD good at. So not so good thing that, just like gradient descent we talked about yesterday, SGD is a sequential algorithm. That means each time you process an example, you need to wait the previous example have been processed. That is, the model has been updated. If not, you should be wait. So just like just like gradient descent, it's really hard to distribute like the SGD things. But because that two algorithms have very similar workload. So for the coordinate descent, each time you process column by column. The SGD process row by row. So the idea to parallelize the coordinate descent also applies here. So we should we introduce two ideas. One is that now each machine process one example, and this machine process at the same time. So here's the figure. So each machine maybe read have a, a part of the data and each one at one time process one example, compute the gradient, send the gradient to the primary server. So on this case, if you have n machines, so the delay should be n minus one because each machine didn't get the, re the rest of the update from the rest of n minus one machines. Remember that for the coordinate descent, if the if features are not so correlated, so it's quite safe and it's perfectly fine if you update several features at the same time. And for the coordinate descent, you need to assume the examples are, correlate, are not so cor correlated. So two examples are not correlated if the long zero features of these two examples are, are different, so that there's little relationship between these two examples, so you can update them at the same time. But generally, it's not true, because remember that we have, for the sparse data, we may have very dense features. So a lot of examples we are hit this feature. So on this feature, example correlated. So that that assumption for coordinate cannot apply to SGD directly. So this is not this is the hard things. The second I, another slightly different model is that instead of compute the gradients, send the gradient to a server. So you can let a group of work, workers form a group. So it will run an individual SGD here. So this group have the old, all this data and have a complete model on this on here. And it, this group can update the model. If we want to exchange the model between different groups, you send the update of the model to the primary server. So this is what Google Brand did. And it's perfectly fine for the system performance because each worker group works individually. And you can add a group as you like and you can 
so some group away. But the problem is still here because all these things model the same, update the same model. They have some correlation between them. So if you have a lot of machines write the same thing together, just like you write the entry with a multi-thread without guarantee everything. So nobody knows what the result comes from. So there's a problem here. If you have a lot of groups, it may affect the converge rate. On pra in practice, we found, we found that if you, have, if you increase the number of machines by 10 times, and you count how many times you need to go to, to reach a particular object function, you find that you only have two, two times speed up. So it's not worse, but the things are different for Google. Google has a lot of machines. He really cares about how many times I need to get these things. So I do not care about the resources, but I care, care about the time. So you can use this one, but for us, we do not have so many machines. We are not Google, so on, in practice, if we run these things, you should have a concern about it because 10 times machines, two times speed up. The second idea is very likely to the block called and descent. That is, rather than process one example at an iteration, we can process a block of examples, just several examples. So we can show that converge rate, here's the converge rate, and because each iteration you have a large workload than the standard SGD. So you can run multi-thread or distributed implementation within this mini batch, just to use the technology we have been discussed uh, uh, yesterday. And the only problem here is that you, you want to increase the mini batch size because you want to increase the workload of iteration so that the cost of multi-thread, cost of distributed computing can be, comparing to the workload, can be minimized. But the problem is that if you increase the mini batch size, you may decrease the coverage rate. On the extreme case, the mini batch size is as large as the training data you have. That is standard gradient descent. So as you know, SGD is faster than gradient descent, so that means your coverage rate goes down. Okay, so, but you can do slightly better things. So let's first look at the overhead of, of a mini batch. So there's two overhead here. One is that the data may be on the disk, maybe on the distributed file system. So each time you need to read the data from disk. That's one overhead. As you know, read disk is much, much slower than read from memory. Secondly, you need to communicate the gradient or the model after the mini batch size. So, so you read disk, communicate over network, so maybe that two overhead dominate the local computations. Here's the nature idea that given you have, you have already paid the overhead for the mini batch, why not do better for on this, in this mini batch? That is, rather than get the data, calculate the first order gradient, update the model, and throw the data away, we can do more things here. So here's one example. So if if the data you have and you solve the object function over this data directly. So you minimize the object function over the mini batch data you have. That is solve a small problem. This problem is a single machine. You can run on a single machine. It's on memory. So you can run complex, sequential, but a fast algorithm on these things. And because, because this is just a part of data, if it too fit this data, you maybe overfit the model because you have some losses. So how to do that is that you may add a regressor here to guarantee that you do not go very far away from the pre previous thing you have. So you won't fit that you, you won't fit more about the mini batch you have, and you guarantee that you do not go far away. So if you solve this problem each time on each iteration, you can guarantee that coverage rate can be increased and yeah, the converge rate is improved comparing to a standard mini batch size. In practice, you don't need to solve this problem exactly. You can solve by some, for example, earlier stop. For example, you can pass the data a few times by called gradient descent, or you can pass the data, the mini batch, a few times by gradient descent. So, for example, you 10 times or maybe five times. So I give some, some experiment here. 
So the first experiment is that on two data sets, fix the number of examples you process and increase the number of mini batch size. Mini batch size. So for the general SGD, for the standard SGD, if we increase the mini batch size, yeah, given the same, same, process, same, same example you have, you decrease the number of iteration you have. That means you go, you go wrong, something wrong here. But if you run a quality descent, solve the exact, solve the sub problem here, and you increase the mini batch size, yeah, it, the impact is, is very is little because you take more advantage for the large mini batch size, and even you can get more from here. The second experiment shows if you get things to a distributed version. So if you run 12 machines and fix the running time to be 1,000 seconds, here, here's the thing you care about. You increase the number of the mini batch size and you find the object function you get is decreased. That is, a large mini batch size increases the performance because that reduces the number of iterations and you reduce the number of disk read, computational, you, uh, late work communication. So, and given the one thousand of running time, you increase the percent of effective workload that you have. So you can make more progress on here. So we, so we give a quick conclusion here. So passive graded design is widely used. Yeah, and I think now every other algorithm, for example, because if the problem is quite complex, the, everything, the only thing you want to have is how to compute the first order gradient of the first order gradient. So for example, if you have very complex deep learning or very complex object function, yeah, you, you maybe have a way to compute the first order gradient. So you can just simply run SGD. So that algorithm is the first one you may want to have a try if your program is not, do not fit onto some standard settings. But distribute the SGD is more difficult than gradient descent because the examples are more correlated maybe. And I think this is a very active research here because for deep learning we really have that problem and we really have problem to scaling, scaling deep learning for the mini batch SGD to a very large scale size. So the most maybe, the most economic way here for deep learning is that you have multiple GPUs, not so many machines, and so that you can enjoy some fast bandwidth and the fast small delays so you can run things. But if it, but it is a problem if you go a large, a large uh, model. So, so next I'm going to, going to show let's have a look at how primary server works and then I show you some examples. So steer the problem. Given learning, given training data, given the model, want to train something. But since difference here, the model may be very large, so that you cannot be stored on a single machine. That as the experiment showed yesterday, we have uh, about six, 60, uh, I think 60 billions of example uh, features. So it's a huge model. So you should put on put on several machines. That is model partition and data partition here. So for the primary server, now you have two group of machines. One is the server, one is the client, one is the worker. Each server, so a worker can communicate with the server. For example, push the gradient at half to the servers, and also the server can communicate with the gradient, with, all, with the worker machines. For example, you have all these worker machines want to tell, talk to a server, so give me the updated model. In fact, this is all to your communication. So next, how to implement the gradient descent? It's quite like what we have been discussed before, but the only two things are different. One is that there are several machines store the model. So this is several machines here. It's not a single machine. Secondly, what you want to care about is that this model, the worker maybe cannot hold this model on the in the single in, in own memory. So because you have a huge model, maybe you cannot hold just the own memory. So this, this is a problem. But luckily, if you really have a large pro parameters, 
That means the data could be very sparse. Otherwise, it's not possible to compute on this data. If you have very sparse data, and each worker only get part of the training data, it's not likely that that training data have all the parameters you have. So what you want to do is that the worker only need to catch the entries of the model that have been shown on this training data. So if this feature do not occur on this training data, I don't need to catch this one. We did some experiments to show the exact numbers. So we randomly partitioned the examples to workers. And if you have only one worker, you need to catch the whole train, the whole model. Yeah, that makes sense. But if we increase the number of workers to 100, each worker only need to catch about 7.8% 7 of the model. And if you increase this one into 10,000 workers, this number goes down, goes about 0.1% of the data. So even that you have a really large model, but you can increase the number of workers so that you can always fit onto the worker's local memory. Okay? So this is how we deal with very huge model. Next, because on the real data, the feature ID, how to, that, that is a identification of the feature, maybe a string, for example. On the, for the ungrand features, maybe just the ungrand. Or for the session feature, maybe just the a session of the click patterns. Or you can do some hashing to hash to a random 64 bits or 128 bits integers. You need so large integers because you need to guarantee the features are not conflict too much. And this is, if you have a map the things onto small integers, you maybe have high conflict rate. And it maybe do not affect how you're training the things. It's, it's okay. Just like Alex has discussed, if you have it using hashing to map the huge feature onto sp very small ones, it's okay on the performance. For example, on the accuracy on the AUC is perfectly fine. But the problem is that we find it has something wrong if you really deploy that model because, because you need to rank in the things. You do not really care about how you classify the things. You really care about the numbers because for each ad, you need to predict the probability will be clicked. This is numbers, and you need to rank in these things. Even that you have slightly precision, not good enough, the ranking can be different. So it can be affect the things. So in this case, you need to have a large integers. And we hope that our model can keep this in large integers differently. Given that thing, the, the problem is that how to assess given a feature ID, how to get the entry from the model. You have a, one, one nature thought is that, okay, use, use a hash map, why not? Because it's a general solution, give a, every, give a key and a give a value. But it could be slow because you need, for a hash map, you need to have a several memory random access. Remember that for the sparse matrix computer, the memory assessment but dominate the performance. And for the hash map, maybe you have several if and else uh, uh, things. So you have a lot of branch misdictions. So using the hash map things, it's about, I think in practice, about five times slower than using a general racing. So I think we can do better because that thing really matters local computation. What you can do another way is that you can localize the global ID onto a local ID. That is, each worker machine get a part of the training data, and you first count how many uni unique keys you have on this data. You get the, all these keys and map, map these keys onto a local training feature ID. Start from one, two, three, four, and it continues. So next, you can make a compact representation of the training data. That is, you map the global key onto local things. Now instead of store the model on the hash map, now you can have just a using array to do the things. So if you do that way, for the local computation, you can just use what you are familiar with. 
So it's an array, it's a sparse matrix. So we have discussed how to do that thing on the first day lecture. The only thing you want to matter is that you need also to keep the global keys because if you want to communicate something between different machines, you need to bring this key keys with you. So the advantage of the localized key solution is that you save, first you save some space. Rather than store the strings or large integers, now you only have 32-bit integers. So at least you save half of the space. Next, okay, you use an array to store the things. You have a, it's much faster than the hash map. The third and the most important thing is that you can reuse some existing libraries. For example, you can use the Eigen3 and the right things like, like Matlab style. The disadvantage is that you need to do some pre-processing. You need to convert the global ID into local ones. This is one overhead. The other thing is that it's only suitable for some applications. So if you have the training data at the beginning, you can do it. Maybe for the online learning, the, the data may be coming and from uh, frequently. So if a new key coming and you want to insert a new key onto the, onto the array, it's not a good idea because you need a lot of memory moving. And for the LDA things, you do not know what the long zero, what to, to topic ID you have, and you do not create at, you do not create at, at the beginning. So you, if some would go to some topic, you create that thing, but you don't now know at the beginning. So you have a lot of key insert. On this case, maybe you want to use a key map, use a hash map solution. So I think this is a trade-off. These are two, two approaches. So next uh, we, we discussed uh, how we communication. That is com communication over global keys. So each worker make, maintain a global key to local ID map, and they use the local key during com local computation. But if you, do, if you do communication, yeah, you need to bring the global key so that everybody knows what is this feature it is. And we have discussed, okay, primary server use batch communication. That is why range-based push and pull. i give an example here. So we have six features, two servers. Each server maintains three features, and you have one worker. Worker only have four keys, so only a part of it. What the, this worker can be do is that you can say, okay, I want to push all this gradients, for example, within the key range three to five. Three and five is a global key you have. What you want to do is that you first look at, okay, look at all these keys during your, your global key array, find the range, and get what the range you have. You find, okay, you only have two, two entries. You push the two entries to the server. Next, you, what you can do is that you can pull, tell the server, I need the, all this model value from the key range three and five. The actual thing you do is that you send the server the, li the actual list that you have, which is three and four, and the server will retain the thing. So this communication, this communication API can, at least you, for example, block call and descend each day, each time you update a block. And yeah, for generally great descent or SGD, you just uh, choose the key range to a very large space. And on the, on the extreme case, you can put the key range to three and three, just to send one key each time. This is highly undesirable because you only send one key and you need to pay the cost sending these things to a to the others and a lot of TCP IP packages and the send things. So it's not a good idea. On general, you want to have a very large key and you maybe send more than one kilobyte of data. What the data send between machines are called a message. Message is quite simple. It's a, you have a product buffer header. It's about command. You, can, you maintain some command what the, the message is about and the stamp you have, and a lot of other information. And also you have a list of the keys, you have a list of variables you have, you want to send. The message, one message may be split onto several ones because a worker maybe just want to, okay, well, I want to send something to all servers. On this case, sorry, 
on this case, yeah, you send to all these two servers here. So, so because you need to care about the four terms, so only the system knows which server is alive and uh, what the key range server has. So that system will spread this single message on several, several ones. Each one goes to one particular server. Because it's a batch communication, you can do a lot of optimizations. I give two examples here. One is that we find that during, between different iterations, you may send the key list again and again. On the, for example, on the gradient descent, each time, each iteration, all the key you have is fixed because your, your training data is fixed. Each time you only you send the whole, the same key list to the server. So in this case, if you can cache, if at the first time, the sender that receive both cache the key list. So, so, so that the next time, the sender do not need to send the key list, key list again. You just send the signature of the key list. Tell the, tell the receiver, so, so I, I just, I know you have been cached these keys. And tells you what the key list it is, and you look up the key list on, the, on your memory, so I do, do not send it again. So this is in, immediately save uh, about half of the space you want to communicate. The other thing that if, if your model is sparse, that means you have an L1 regressor, for example. So most of the weight may be zeros. And you can have some user-defined filter. For example, we have shown yesterday, if the weight is, if the worker find the counter weight is zero, I, and I predict that this weight will, go, will remain zero for the next iteration. So I can skip this one. I do not compute the gradient on this feature and do not send it so that it should be a zero here. So if you have a lot of zeros, what you can do is that you can use compression. For example, using Slappy, a very, very fast compression library, it's as fast as one pass of memory, but you can effectively reduce the size of the zero things. And also you can do some, I think, for the Google Ads system using a, yeah, you can, because, because if it's zero, the bit is zero, so you can have a different encoding things to re-encoding the things to reduce the zeros. So if you have a lot of zeros, you can do some optimization here to do not have the zero things. And because compression or doing the encoding things is quite, is much cheaper than sending the things over network. So it's a desirable way to do it. Next, I give a quick overview of the system components. And I think it's necessary to, it's also some fundamental things if you want to implement a machine learning system. One is the system, the core system. One is the application. It, that is, what is the optimization algorithm you want, gradient design, coordinate design, and something. And one is the parameters. That is a global shared data, data structure for the model. You can have, for example, we have been discussed, you can save as the sorted key value vectors. And also, you can store as a hash map. And also, you can have different data structure for different applications. We think that there's no good, no single best data structure for all these algorithms. So it's generally a good idea to have different things for different algorithms. And you have different loss function, different pen penalty functions, and a lot of. I think I can skip the details. The, oh, OK, this is what the thing, the thing stand in between machines. So we call this function the when. You can, send them, you can carry some messages. So you have a L thread on this function. And you listen to your IP and listen to your pod. If somebody sells you some, send you something, yeah, you get things and return to the system. And also, the local system can send from this local IP to the other things. So to implement this thing, you have two, two, two options. One is that you can use a socket like a library. We use zero and Q, so it's like it's, it's a friendly socket. In fact, it's a friendly socket library. I think. Nowadays, people are quite interested in RDMA, remote direct memory access. That means if, if some guy sends some data to me, 
So the first thing is I go to the network card. Then I go to the kernel, and then go to the user library, the user space. So you have you 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 have to do several things. What you can do is that you do not necessarily go to CPUs. You just the network card can read the memory directly and return the value to you. So you can you can reduce the latency between goes to the CPU, move to the register, move to the user space, and yeah, but it's quite limited. If you if you have a hash map and you change the memory structures, that thing, all, all, all that things should be changed. But if you do not change things too much and you have an array, I didn't make save some, some reduce some latency. The second thing I think is worth to mention is that what is the thread model? Because it's not single thread system. Because it's a, a synchronous system, you need to care about the thread you have. I give an example here. So for the primary server, the whole system is the core system called post office because you can send some message for it. And all these things are called customers. For example, you have two customers, maybe it's a gradient descent, it's a learning algorithm, and this is the weight, the model you have. Each one has a thread. This one also has a thread. It's a receiving thread. So generally what you want to do is that the scheduler first tells all these work machines, okay, uh, do iteration one. What you do is that the scheduler send a message to this work, this machine. This thread will read the message for you and the look up, okay, this is messages goes to that customer. So I put the things onto the, onto the buffer here. The running thread of this, this guy will read the message here and the look at, okay, this is, means do it right. So I can run, I can call, I can call the function you have, that is computer gradient, send a gradient. How to send it? You put the message onto the buffer and the post office will send it for you. And the only, the only, thing, near, the only thing that you may be near to call something back call something, for example, update something if the pulled value is coming back. What you can do is that, because you do not want to wait, it really come back, you, you must let this thread to do something else because it's a asynchronous system. What you can do is that, you tell that, you tell the wait, okay, if something go back, you should run it. You give this one a function call. So next time, and if the pulled value is coming back, it still goes to the post office, and this is this time, okay, this message is for this guy, and go to the, the buffer, um, this thread, read the buffer, update its own data structure, and uh, find that, okay, there's a function call. I must have called because, because this guy tells me, and this thread will run the things. The only thing matters that what you need to care about which thread is running the function. Because this guy can be running, this guy can be running. So if two functions called by different thread want to write the same data structure you have, you need to place a lock here. So this is something, something good because you have, it's a synchronous system, maybe more efficient. The not so good thing that you need to care about, okay, this is a multi-thread system. And the things maybe goes wrong if you do not guard, guard your their own data structures. Okay, so give a conclusion here. The primary, the kind of implementation supports extremely large model and it's a synchronous system. Can be parallelized the CPU and the network. And it supports some flexible, consistent model. And you do some local ID to look global feature ID to local feature ID mapping so that you can write some program like a single thread map, matab, or like code. But the not so good thing is that it's a little bit complex to understand it because you have multi-thread and it's necessary to have an idea what a multi-thread system looks like because if you want to have the faster performance, you need to have a good idea what a thread it is. Okay, so next, i show you some demos. The first demo is that I run, I just run on the, data, on the training data 
using 64 features. So this is the feature ID. And this is a group ID. So each feature have about 100 features. And the feature ID, group ID, this is a zero one value. So I didn't store the value here. So the, so OK, let's try it. I didn't try, I didn't go the EC2 this day because I ran out of money. So just, uh, I have $10 at the beginning and I reference one and refer a guy. So I receive another $20 and I run a night and it's gone. So, so let's go some small cluster of smallest cluster. And it's quite small. You have about 12 machines. And each machine CPU is not so good enough. The, the, most, the most not good thing is that it, the network is not so great. You have a small network. So here's the data. I, sh I first show you the data. Okay, show. Sure. OK, here's the a slightly larger data than the previous CTRA we have. It's about, so this is each part of data is about one gigabyte. You have about, I think it's about one minute examples on each part. So I have, so what I go wrong is have about 24 parts. So each load will get two parts. So. The only thing I want, I need to change is. Okay. I need to change the configurations. So tell us how, which data you want to use. Okay, here I just changed the data onto from CTIA to CTIB. This is the only change I want to have. Oops. Next, I just run it. OK, here is exactly as the, what I, sorry, you, maybe you guys cannot hear it, cannot look at it. I use MPR run and tell us what the host you have and create about 20 processes because I'm using, I'm using four servers, 12 workers because I have 12 machines and the, work, the server machine do not do very workload so I can use every number I have. And each worker runs about a thread and tells what the application configuration you have. And okay, you can just run it. It's a little bit slower because, because now you have about 21 megabyte of training examples. The key range is it's now it's a general, it's a general large number. It's about it's an integer 64 bit number. The data is placed on a network shared file system, so you have about 30, 30 gigabyte data. So because it's quite a slow machine. All these things are on a single disk. So you have 12 machines to read the things from a single disk. It's quite slow, in fact. So here's the network bandwidth you're using. And this is one machine. Because now you are reading the data. Uh, OK, large number. Because the, OK. Here's the, about the limits, the network limit of this machine. It's a, 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 sm a small network card. And all these machines are read the disk from this single machine. So generally speaking, it's not a good idea. But if it goes to the distributed file system, it's, it's okay then, because several things 
because the data are placed on several machines too, so you enjoy the several bandwidths you have. Okay, so maybe I cannot wait. It's about five, six minutes, in fact, I have to do it. So this is, I just show you something I wrote before. Okay, here's the, I wrote about uh, one hour ago. Okay, you load data using 10 minutes, as we have discussed before. Maybe you read data, use the most of the time you have, if the data is not placed on the right place. And for the first iteration, you have about uh, 600 minutes of features, and you use about 19, 900 seconds. Because it's a sparse, you have a sparse regressor, you can reduce the, the actual model size, and it's not so large. And this is the KKD filter, it's a user defined filter. That means I predict that feature should be remain on zero. I ignore it. So the next iteration, the number of features and processes is, have been reduced to, to the, about 30 megabytes of data. And so that means the local, the local computation tends to decrease, and also the, the communication decrease, because you only need to send so many, so many, so many entries, and you have compression, and you have key cache, and you can reduce the network bandwidth. And for the rest of one, it's almost the, almost the same. Mm. This, so. Maybe it's not a good idea to test more things because it's quite slow. Okay, it's still not get done. Let's go here. So next, I want to show you how to how to implement a, a loss function. What I want to implement what I want to implement is a square hinge loss. So it's slightly different than hinge loss because the hinge loss is not smooth on this point. So you cannot compute the gradient here, you do not, the gradient is not unique. What you can do is that you can have a, on this point you can use a square thing, so you have a smooth here. The bad thing is that, okay, you place a lot of penalty here, you, the penalty you pay for very not classified good things goes to very large. But you enjoy, you have a, it's a smooth function, and you have a, second order gradient descent. What I want to implement is that, how to implement this thing on the primary server. So in fact, it's quite easy. Several lines of code is enough. So, so you go to the loss directory. So here's loss. So you have this is a general function of a loss function. So what do you want to have? You have two functions. One is evaluate the loss. The second is how to compute the gradient. I give the data you have. This is the data. This is generally a, a, a vector of matrix point. And this is the gradient you want to up, output. So basically, you want to, because it's quite like a logic loss. So what do you want to do is that look at logic loss and copy the, just do a copy here. So it's a, the base function, the base class is a binary classification loss and two functions you want to implement, maintain, implement. One is evaluate. Given the label you have, given the x times w you have. So the, e, the e array map is a, it's a very convenient thing that Eigen map announce you pass it a point you have, tells it what what the length you have, then then they just give a whopper over your memory. So you can use in the all the icons operations. So I give the memory, I can do some operation for me, and I can manage my memory because it's generally not a good good idea to let let I can to do all the memory management for you because if you have a very large data, 
that I can maybe copy a lot for you. So you have a lot of memory copy. You, you, if you want memory efficient, you, a good, good idea that you keep using this eigenmap class. So I just copy it and create a square, square loss. Oops. I change the function a and first of all this is different let's look at what the equation it is so you one minus y times xw max eigen array so oh so Zero. Give the length you want, and do uh, square and do sum. Okay, here's the object function you have. Next, you compute because I want I only want to run gradient descent. I only want to compute the first order gradient. So. This is, yeah, it's quite, it's not. So it's about x times, it's about 2 times x times, ah, sorry, how to compute that things. 1 minus y times x, this one. Okay, this is for if if y minus y times t is greater than zero, then it goes to this direction. But if not, I need to it's the gradient should be zero and times if it's more than zero, uh, it's greater than zero. That means y times t less than. Sorry, it's greater than zero, less, less than one. So if if it's less than one, it should be this value onto zero, because for eigen three, this means that it's a the bool. Uh, this this value returns you a bool array, so you need to convert the the tab template cast. Okay, I think it should be y, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next thing is that you need to test this system you have increased a lot, you have added a loss here. The first step is add a configuration here. Go to a pro. Proto, configure dot proto, and it goes to the north configuration. Yeah, you need to. Okay, this is not. Okay, I already add this here. So, you already have a tab here. So this is the product buffer type, so that you can add a configuration during running. Next is, if the config tab equals to ingenos, I is not this one. OK, this one, I return. This is a pointer, it's a shared pointer. Return a new.
Okay, it's done. It's compiled. Ah, I didn't include the head file. Let's not call this name. Okay, it's not T here. I just copied the equation. One, per, one particular good thing is that if you're using this high-level math language, like it's not like you have it's more easy to debug because you can compare with the, with the, your equations. And this is true for MATLAB, for Python, but for C++, it's generally not good at, generally not easy to write a machine learning algorithm. But next, I can run it and change the gradient descent configuration so, so that I use a different loss. I use a Square hinge. hinge, and because square hinge, you cannot start with with a zero mem uh, weight because if it goes zero, the gradient should be will remain zero. It will be remain zero forever. So you need to have a randomized uh, have a randomized uh, initialization. Okay, and that's right. Okay, it's not converge. The first thing you can do is that you decrease the number of any rate. Okay, so it's like too small. You increase it. Because I didn't add the adaptive grading here, I just used the, used the original grading design. So and yeah, this works, looks like better. So it's almost done. So for sparse data, maybe you still want to use adaptive gradient, even that for hinge loss, for everything. So another thing, I think it should be, a, if you're interested, it's a good idea to, to, to implement the hyper hinge loss. You solve the square hinge loss problem if the loss goes to, to, to small, the penalty will go to large because it's quadratic. Now the only change you have that you remove this non-smooth thing by a smooth quadratic turn here. So it's worked really great on practice, in practice. Next, as I conclude the whole tutorial, I think on this five-day tutorial, we have discussed about internet in, instruct, sorry, industrial scale problem. We show what is a computational advertising, how to get the data, how to get the feature. So we get about visually get about 100 billion of examples, 10 billion of features, 
and the data size about one terabyte to one petabyte. So even the, pro the, the problem is not that we do not have data, we do not have learning algorithm. The problem is that we have limited machine learning resources. So the CPU is not so large, the machine is not so powerful, the network is quite limited. So this is a key question we have faced. Secondly, we introduced how to distributize several algorithms. For example, gradient descent and the corner-wise gradient descent and the row-wise stochastic, uh, stochastic gradient descent. The latter two are very not easy to parallelize. So lastly, we show how to implement a system scale to such a large scale and how to use that system and show some demo. Mm. I think nowadays, what, given the big data we have, given the current machine we have, I think on the, on the coming few years, there should be a, a lot of research interest on the scal scalability. Because we care about the computation, we care about the, the electrophy, we care about the running times. And on this data, I think this the implementation, distributed computing is a very interesting one because in the maybe on few day, on few years, it's not possible to a single machine scale to too large, so large problem. And so, I think distributed computing is a necessary component. And for the next few years, I think there's a lot of hardware change because the hardware also fit the workload. The workload also fit the hardware. So that's a huge opportunity to co-design of the system, co-design of the hardware, co-design of machine learning applications. So I hope this tutorial gives you a, a good idea, a intuition what we have done and what things is good at distributed computing, what things is you probably do not want to do to down on distributed computation. I hope I can give you some Inside some motivation, so you can do some great future work. And if you are interested, please talk to me, so we can have something, work something together. So thank you. I maybe I sh I put on the website tonight.